City Council works. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, now. Now we're ready. Welcome, everybody, to the City Council work session. It's Monday, uh, August 10th, 2020, 4 30 p.m. at the Thomas J. Smith Council Chambers here in City Hall. Uh, proposed regular agenda for August 17th, 2020. First up is a public hearing. Consider, well, let me change that. I said I was going to do this. First up, we're going to do our discussion items. Uh, and that would be Tree Advisory Board Update, Scott Zeiser. You're up, Scott, first. Thank you. I am Scott Zeiser, uh, 11456 Upper Flint Road, Burlington, Iowa. I am here to report or my annual report from the Tree Advisory Board. I am the chair. And our committee is Robert Walker, Lisa Loke, Dale Smizer, Dave Hazel, Joyce Tager, and Kelly Rundell. Um, accomplishments this past year um, in the fall October 3rd of 2019 which seems a long time ago um, we hosted two events at the outdoor classroom and one was a planning demonstration for the first grade class of Blackhawk Elementary and the other was an open demonstration tree planting open to the public um, we utilize that outdoor classroom at Kirkwood Park if we can most of the time, it's a great setting, a learning experience, and it's all um, will hold future events coming on. Um, February 12th, we had a contractors meeting for uh, the the tree people in Burlington, Iowa. Sh show them um, what Burlington uh, expects out of them as a company and, and their regulations and their their um, laws. Um, since 1992 to 2019, Trees Forever has awarded grant money to the city of Burlington in the amount of $142,900. With these dollars, the, the city has estimated it planted 14 to 15,000 trees. So that's quite an accomplishment there. Uh, the forestry division has been working to complete the routine pruning throughout the city. Um, in zone 19, we have zoned different zones, so they transfer to one zone to another in the city. And um, they have completed over 1,400 work records since this time one year ago. Um, we are continually working with geoforestry to properly log Otter Island. We will assist Aspen Grove in August, well, coming up in two weeks, with their tree inventory. We're going to help them with their tree inventory of all the trees in Aspen Grove Cemetery locations. Um, we are going to try to have a tree climbing competition. Uh, Whitey Walker is going to try to head this up. He's, he's very engaged in this activity. He's seen it in Indiana and he wants to bring it to 2021 to Burlington, Iowa. And then we are updating Jefferson and Main Streets with the assistance of the Tiger Grant. So that is my re annual report. If you have any questions, I can try to answer them. If not, Patrick from the city of Burlington is here also. So, Questions, guys? What are the most hardy trees to plant? Seem Everything seems to be coming natives, down in these winds anymore. Our natives are oaks. We have too many maples, basically red maples. The hard maples, the sugar maples are very hardy. And there's other good trees, hackberries, black gum, some of those varieties that we're trying to sub in for the ash that we lost. So there are, there are good trees out there, but the native trees are your best trees. Okay. Scott, would, has there been any discussion uh, what kind of trees are going to use on the Tiger Grant areas, Main Street and Jefferson? That, um, I think, Patrick, that would be a question okay. for Patrick. Come on up, Patrick, if you would, please. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have looked at a couple different uh, trees for that um, from the company that's kind of doing the, the bids for us. They kind of are, are assessing what would look good down there for uh, okay. for for the buildings and everything, and for maintenance wise. So they're looking at like some ginkgos, some some pear trees. Um, I believe that they have a Kentucky coffee going in there, and then like on it, it's going to be different than what. Jefferson and Maine are going to be completely different kind of plantings. Okay. Um, you're going to have some of the bigger oaks and some uh, uh, Kentucky coffee trees or, some, or something like that on, on Main Street, and you're going to have the sm smaller, medium-sized trees on Jefferson, so we're not overwhelming the buildings with, with the canopy. Sounds good. Yep. Thank you. Yep. 
Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate the work you do on that, Scott. You're Thank welcome. you. Thank you. All right. Next up would be a Historic Preservation Commission update. Steve Freeber. Hello. Good to see everybody. Uh, Steve Freebert, uh, the uh, chairman of the City's Historic Preservation Commission, 1717 South Main. Uh, typically, we do this update in May during National Historic Preservation Month, but of course, we all know how that goes. <laughs> um, so let me give you just kind of a quick rundown of what we have accomplished in 2019. Uh, along with myself, uh, the other commissioners are Hal Morton, uh, David Rode, Judy Stevens, Mark Fisher, uh, last year, we also had Barb Nelson Botts. She was our Heritage Hill uh, neighborhood representative. Uh, she was replaced by Jane Schulte. Uh, and then last year, we also had Kay Weiss on the committee. Um, the commission, she uh, stepped down at the end of her term uh, at the beginning of this year and has been replaced by Stephanie Brakeville. Uh, in 2019, we uh, met six times as a commission. We had a quorum at each uh, meeting. We did have nine alterations to National Register properties in 2019. Uh, at 423 North 3rd Street, which is uh, the good restaurant, uh, we um, approved siding replacement and uh, rebuilding of a second floor porch. Uh, at the depot, uh, windows and interior rehab on the, the former diner wing of it. Uh, 718 Columbia at 8th and Columbia, uh, we approved four uh, front and side porches uh, and they've uh, done some roof work. I believe that uh, is continuing. Uh, 425 Valley, the Blowell building, uh, total rehab uh, building uh, was begun last year, completed this year. Uh, 300 and 310 Jefferson, the Tama and c &E buildings, demolition was completed in 2019. Um, 803 Jefferson, Pookie's Thai Cuisine had a storefront uh, reconfiguration. At 805 Jefferson, the collective uh, interior rehab and paint. Uh, and then a project I really like to, to make special note of at in Crapo Park, the Hawkeye Log Cabin. Uh, last year we worked with the city and uh, Heritage Trust uh, volunteers did the labor uh, to re-roof the Hawkeye Log Cabin. So that was, that was a really nice project. Uh, last year we had no local uh, historic uh, properties designated by uh, the commission and none were delisted. Uh, we did meet the required training uh, to maintain our certified local government status uh, in 2019. That uh, included several of us attending the Preserve Iowa Summit uh, in Newton uh, in June of last year. Uh, last year's public outreach project uh, was kind of a follow-up on uh, the Heritage Hill neighborhood uh, design guidelines. We gave a, uh, a public presentation of those guidelines uh, on May 15th of last year. And then just very briefly, uh, what we hope to accomplish in 2020, you know, given the situation we're all in, uh, we, we have participated in some online uh, state uh, trainings, including the State Preservation Conference, which went uh, all digital uh, online uh, in June. And thank you very much uh, to the city for covering our um, a registration fee uh, for, for that conference. Uh, we still hope to plan some kind of preservation related public activity, uh, perhaps this fall. Um, remains to be seen just what that is and what that will entail, but we'll keep you in, uh, in the apprised of that. Um, uh, something we've talked about a bit is uh, a few of our commissioners would like to see us explore the possibility of some kind of incentive and or recognition of uh, historic rehab projects that have been done well. I think that would be a good way not only to uh, promote uh, the work that the commission does and the design guidelines as the people who live in the Heritage Hill District uh, need to follow them, but also uh, kind of give them a pat on the back for doing things the correct mm -hmm. way. Um, and along with that, we want to continue publicizing the Heritage Hill design guidelines, you know, especially as people move in and out of that district. We want to make sure new homeowners are aware of of uh, the, the ordinance and what that entails. Uh, it's a little early, but we would always encourage uh, the city to uh, budget uh, some money for a CLG grant. Uh, those um, grant applications are due right about now, um, and, and so it's, it's obviously too late for this year, but uh, a certified local government grant could be used for things like uh, bringing a conference here, bringing a workshop here, uh, doing some historic site uh, survey work or a National Register nomination. So those are all 
uh, things that would be paid for. I believe it's 50% uh, by a CLG grant, so that might be something worth following up on. Uh, and then lastly, uh, it's tentatively scheduled for tomorrow. Uh, we are supposed to be meeting with it. Uh, Doug Wells, the uh, developer of the Tama site, on his plans for uh, the infill buildings that would be going there. Um, so we'll see whether or not that happens. I understand they had some weather problems out west of us today, un unsurprisingly. Uh, so that's tentatively scheduled tomorrow. And I think that's kind of one of the last things that he needs to do before really he can start work on that new development. Uh, and then, of course, we remain um, uh, engaged in the process with whatever happens with Cascade Bridge, which is a National Register historic site. At this point, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions, Ken? Steve, you yeah. mentioned bringing something to the local area with the, the grant. What would that look like? What would the cost be? Um, what would you what be was bringing? It, Eric, the design guidelines, that was about a $14,000, $15,000 total cost. Yeah. So that was about $7,000 paid from a CLG grant. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that was probably top number. I think. Yeah. Most of our projects have been quite a bit less than that. So, you know, we could bring somebody in to do a historic window repair workshop that would, you know, might be, I don't know, $1,000 or something. Um, putting on a, you know, a full conference obviously takes a lot more work and a lot more uh, uh, funding. But uh, in terms of survey work, a lot of that is, is done by volunteers working in concert with, with a consultant. So there's a lot of, uh, uh, different choices here you know in a way it's uh, the Commission could uh, offer some suggestions to the council hey we think these are, are some uh, activities that would be beneficial for the community and that way you kind of guide us along the way I know Steve I've really enjoyed when you do your seminars and you talk about the old homes or anything mm -hmm. was there any way we could move that into I see that on a big grand scale uh, is there any way we could get funding and then do something like that? Um, in terms of doing a public presentation yeah. or, um, you know, I've, I've and that room it. was packed when I it was, was there. Yes. I love it was packed. Yeah, it was a good it. program. Um, it was very, it was well done, very well done. We talked about I, a long time ago, like probably several iterations of the city website ago. We used to have have a version of that on uh, the the city's website. We could we could think about doing that again. Uh, with an updated version, but uh, yeah, I'm I'm always happy to give yeah. that presentation. I could see you on the ones. speaking tour doing that. That was fun. Well, that'd be fun. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. <laughs> Once Work we're allowed to, more. you know, Work travel some again, more. Right? Those yeah. were good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, uh, yeah, I, I would love to do more like that. I, I think the more we engage people uh, in appreciating their their built surroundings, you know, we have a wonderful historic city here, and, and the more people learn about it, the more they appreciate it. So, yeah, I would agree. you're right. right. A lot of hidden gems here. Yep. Thanks, Steve. Any other questions for Steve? Okay. No, good to see you, though. Thanks, Steve. Thank thanks for thanks. thanks. Thanks to the commission for their work. Appreciate it. Uh, next up would be the parking pass uh, discussion. Who's leading that? Uh, this has Steve. been a, a topic that has come up of a couple of different times, and it's been protracted over a long period of time. Uh, one of the things that uh, has come to light. Uh, is that uh, we have an awful lot of parking passes that are out there for the senior center. We also don't have a formal policy that recognizes what the justification for that. Uh, our current code of ordinances, and I think the chief could speak to this a little bit better than I can, but uh, there is no discretion that's written in there in terms of the hours. Uh, the only thing that I can think of to come up with that would give some level of coverage for that is a resolution or a modification of the ordinance that carves out a street or something, some format that gives some consistency for the uh, police department to justify what they're do doing. Uh, even with an, a resolution uh, that uh, authorized parking passes, I'd, we'd have to check a little bit on the legality and how we do that in a way that is appropriate, that doesn't put us into a p potential problem with uh, how we do other tickets for, for others. Uh, but with that being said, uh, we do have this a, a, a request to have a, a set number of parking passes allowing uh, individuals that are using the senior center to um, 
park on Jefferson or one of the side streets where there are some limitations for the hours of, of usage. And with that, I'll turn that over to the representatives from the Senior Center for having their request. Hi. Can I'm please Carolyn Cloak from the Senior Center, the president there. And please give and your address, too, please. I beg please give your address, too, please. 607 North Central Avenue. Thank you. And uh, as they've already talked about the passes, uh, I understand that some of the passes in the past have been abused. And uh, I was not aware of that, but I can see how that can happen. But um, what we have thought now, if we had passes, we would make it so that they would have to sign them out and bring them back again that night. You know, that on Mondays hmm. is the biggest card playing time. And we do make a little bit of money at that. Not much, but it's one of our better parts. And uh, so there have been some that have gotten tickets, $15 tickets. One just um, last week, I guess. And then there is one lady that that was one way that she could get out and do some things. She walks with a walker. It's very hard for her to get in and out, even though she has to come up the ramp. Um, and she got a ticket. And so she had to decide that she could not do this anymore because she just couldn't afford to do that. And uh, so these are the people that I'm really concerned about. I don't personally. Um, at this present time have time to play cards and I'm there some of the days that I open mm -hmm. and I see these people come in. Some people do bring their parents, not very many, but there's a couple that do. And uh, I can see that it would be very hard for them. Some of the people that are there could probably help them, uh, but some wouldn't even be able to help the other person. So it would really, we could, we could work the passes. Somebody could go out, put them on, bring them back in. <clears throat> so if we could just have a few passes, so that would, we'd get these people in. Because otherwise, they don't get out. They stay at home. Mm -hmm. And I'm finding mm -hmm. out, even in my own family, with a sister that has been put in assisted living and uh, with the COVID going on. She can't get out that much. Mm -hmm. And uh, when she calls and talks to me, she just talks and talks and talks because she don't have anybody around. Mm -hmm. So it's very important for these people to get out. And uh, that's what we're wanting. How, how many passes do you have right now? Um, because we, we don't know. Do we have any at all? How many parking tickets? Passes. Oh, there isn't very many out. Um, I would say the most would have been 10. A lot of them I have passed on. And, and you know, we used to have 15. Okay. Because at one point in time, if I remember right in the discussion, we had a problem with another group that down there that was making their own. Yeah. Is that correct? And they're, there, they're not there no okay. more. Carolyn, let me ask you this. The, the people that got tickets, is that because they did not have passes or their time ran out or, or what or happened? The other, oh, the ones that got tickets, they, they parked on the side that was three hours, but Went over. they're there from noon to four. Okay. Okay. And that, bridge players and pinnacle players yeah. hoping to increase that a little bit uh, with um, more cards you know encouraging other card players mm -hmm. like euchre or whatever that might come in because um, it's a cheap afternoon oh yeah two dollars oh yeah to play <laughs> not cheap if you get a 15 dollar ticket though. <laughs> 
<laughs> no. I know one of the things one of the hair salons does downtown is they keep track of what time their customers come in. And if that time elapses, then they take the keys and then they move the vehicle move the for time. them. I don't know if that would be um, something that would possibly, work for you guys. I know it's a hassle. It, once in a while, there would be somebody that would be able to do that. Mm -hmm. We have a couple of people that, a couple or three people that come that probably could do that for someone. Because I hate yeah. to have them sitting at home lonely and not yeah. socialized. Yeah. That really brings and on that's, dementia early. That's really bad for For some of those people, health. that's all that they have. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But we need to have policy. I mean, we need to have something that yeah. Jim can put on paper, not just we want people to move each other's cars. Yeah. And we, need to have, um, we need to have something. So that back parking lot is free. Yeah. And, and as I understand it, cars start <clears throat> typically at the same time every week. Is yeah. that correct? Yeah. Did, ever, did everybody pretty much show up on time? There, um, well, with the back parking lot, there are several of us that have been parking in that mm -hmm. to leave it for other people. If we know it's a day that there's not going to be very many, those of us who can, you know, park on the side and not have to worry about being in the front or whatever, we make sure that we park down further than the handicap. And because uh, some of us do have that um, handicap pass, and I have Parkinson's, and I have that, but I try to park further down so other people can have that, you know. So the reason I was asking, I was wondering if if looking for a solution because there the, the problem is we have to be fair to the other businesses in that area. I you, understand you, you that. And I've had that discussion, so. Uh, I'm wondering is if we, and I haven't run this by anybody yet, or it's just an idea off the top, and it's going to involve Nick, whether we would have a, if we knew what time they were generally coming, if we had a city bus, which typically has some access capabilities, uh, that would pick them up at the Valley Street lot and bring them, and drop them off at the front, and then again, when cars was over, we'd run a bus down there. Now, I don't know what his schedule is. We'd have to look at that, but that might be, one way utilizing that free lot where you could be there for a while uh -huh. uh, which i'd have to i'd have to nick I'd, i'm sorry to spring that on you uh, but that would be something i don't know if we have the, the capabilities to do something like that okay and I'm not even sure. I haven't been on a bus in a while. I'm not a sure city how. city bus that runs, well, we have multiple city buses that run through the downtown after the top of every hour. So they're at the depot at the top of the hour, and then they leave from there pushing westward. So by, you know, whatever, 05, we would probably be through this section of town, it, you know, on an hourly basis, and we come back towards that same direction. So, so your suggestion is to well, bus them to the lot behind them? Well, yeah, pick them up like a bus stop. Pick them up at the Valley Street and drop them off the front door and then come back through later. And whoever who's needing a bus, I, pick them up and bring them back to the Valley. I, I'm fairly sure we have buses that probably take that type of route now. Okay. That I can make them be aware of that. Because, I mean, that would, that would at least get you. We'd have free parking access, but also they wouldn't have to walk. Yeah. From from back yeah, there up the sidewalk because like, it is a little bit of a grade people. there. Thanks, Nick. Yeah. I, I'm, that might be something worth worth looking at. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know how the rest of the council feels about it, but I I'd like to see us use the the free parking because then you can be there as long as you need to. Yeah. And if that runs every hour, it it could. And if we made it kind of a stop, we could pick you up, run you back to the parking lot, pick you up at the parking lot, and run you back up the the senior center entrance. So I don't know if that if that works or not. I'm sure that's going to be a little bit would be a lot more work for this, yeah. the city bus, for but that's city. what the bus is for. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if and, something like that or the passes could just yeah. be because it's just a Wednesday and a Friday. Those that, are the two days. Mon that, is Monday that's the Monday only two days. Monday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Is that Monday, what is? Wednesday night. So they don't you don't even have to worry about that one. Yeah. Um, and Friday and if they if uh, sometimes on Fridays they don't but they like to as much as they can so okay and the Wednesday is a night a night yeah. afternoon situation yeah. Okay. yeah because it's really hard for some of those people I see them huffing and puffing when they come in 
one old gentleman that we have, he um, has uh, a lot hard time and his daughter brings him and you can tell him just getting in mm -hmm. inside and he's one that wants to set up everything for his card players and uh, finally he'll sit down because he's just so out of breath and gets his oxygen on. So, yeah, we would really appreciate that. Oh. Are the times the same for Monday and Friday? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. So most of you would communicate this to the card players that the bus is going to be there at yeah. about what time? Now, what if the weather's bad, Nick? How does that enter? Can they yeah. be given a phone number and call the driver or something? That might be. Yeah. Well, the, the simplest solution for the police department and for the city is to not have any passes. Because I understand you know that. You know how that works. Because we give passes to you. I've had people call me, well, why can't I get a pass? You know, I, I employ so many people downtown. Why can't I get a pass? Because I need to get back and forth to my business. And so it really puts us in a tough spot. Yeah. However, we do want to accommodate as much as we can. Yeah. Uh, that's why I was just sitting there thinking, okay, looking at that, is, is, could that be a solution, or at least could we try it and see if that doesn't help? Okay. Uh, you know, it's not, it's, not ten pa it's not 10 passes, but that's something, and if, then if we, you know, if we saw the parking lot was getting full, then we could re yeah. revisit that again. But if, if the bus could come in and pick them up right at the, right at the back of their car, or if they could walk just a few steps to the bus, and they get off and we'd let them right off at the front door, that might be worthwhile. See, I, I think I don't necessarily want to rely on Nick's buses in uh -huh. order to be able to achieve that. And the reason is, is if they're closing up shop, and now you got people waiting because they need a ride from the front door to the, their vehicles or vice versa. I when got it gets you. cold, that's not going to be an option. I think we're just asking for trouble. I'm okay with the passes, to be honest with you. I, I would like for you guys to define... A peak time that you feel like they're absolutely necessary and then they would only be allowed to be used during those times mm -hmm. not a 24 7 pass but yeah. you know if you need it a Monday from 1 to 4 then they're only valid Monday from 1 yeah. to 4 we do um, have a uh, Harmon Airs which is the, our own little yeah, I, I, don't, I don't particularly care on Thursday who uses them. you know and we're only there for yeah. from 1 to 3 and so it's not we don't we're not taking up a lot of time two days and then the one short day so you know Could, i understand the other problems and then I, and then again for for those people who participate that can use the free parking i'll just leave it up to you guys to police it i don't know that we need to necessarily do that um and uh, encourage them to use the free parking um i don't want you to have 15 passes i think that that's a little excessive <clears throat> Excuse me, but I think that there's a reasonable number. Whether that's five, seven, ten, I don't know. But what, what, I how, could go with ten. Well, <coughs> let's, okay, why, don't, why don't we look? Why don't we? Why don't we try to put a number on it? Can you give us your schedule and how many participants, kind of on average, and write that down for us, and we can look at that, okay. and that way we can kind of maybe determine the passes because you know. Um, you understand where we're coming from, I, I think. Do. You and I, you, we've all had that discussion, but it can't be right. It can't be 15. I don't know if 10 is the right number, but if we had an idea what your peak times were, okay. you know, and then if you change those times, you know, of course, we could always adapt, but that might give us a little bit more. I don't really want to put this off any longer. Uh -huh. So if you could put that, give us a schedule uh, okay. together. What about if I email you that that would be great if you could okay. give me that and kind of account about how many you know and then maybe uh we could take that to the parking uh, the parking uh study whatever whatever we call parking commission, commission and get, work with them and see if we can't come to a number that everybody including your neighbors is comfortable with okay would that would that be that would be great and then in the meantime you know if we can work out something where the people do choose use a lot maybe we can incorporate that that bus okay. uh, route. So let's if you get that to us, we'll get with the parking commission, and we'll okay. try to get an answer to this thing so we can put it to put it to bed. Okay. Does that sound good? One of the one of the other things that I would say, and I just throw kind of caution to the wind a little bit, is if you guys are going to let um, 
people use them, I would encourage you not to have those people park in front of businesses that are along the street. Uh, more try to keep it uh, located close to your position or to the to your address. And the reason is, if 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 you we let you continue to use them and they get abused or people perceive that they're being abused or their shop is one that's constantly being parked in front of then they're going to likely come and want to talk to us and then it becomes an issue again and we may not be the council members at that point in time so I, um, I would just encourage you to kind of police it amongst yeah. yourselves okay okay I think we can do that we got a plan of action then yes hope. all right thank you very much you bet thank thanks you. Carolyn now we're going to let you out in the middle of the storm <laughs> Yep. Yep. Thanks. Thanks, Carolyn. Thanks, Mr. Cole. All right. And then, since we're doing the discussion items, we'll go ahead and do the appointments. Uh, there are three. Uh, first, all first is Flint Hills Golf Course Advisory Committee uh, Commission Member Richard Maxwell's term has expired. He is interested in re-serving uh, again, so it's it's requested that we reappoint him to a new three-year term. Housing Appeals, uh, Commission Member Sid Carter resigned in July. Uh, Patricia Walls has uh, in expressed an interest in serving, and so it's recommended that Council appoint, uh, consider appointing Patricia Walls to fill his unexpired term, which would end in 2025. And Renewable Energy Committee Commission Member Justin Norona's term has expired in June. He has expressed an interest in serving an additional three-year term so it's requested that we consider reappointing him. Does anybody have any questions or problems with those appointments? Looks good. Okay, now we'll move on to the proposed regular agenda. Um, first up is a public hearing consideration of the Burlington, Burlington Locust Basin Sewer Project as required by the Community Block Development Grant. At the, at the public hearing, Susan Coffey will be here uh, to go over the CDBG process. With the project, uh, it's funded with the $600,000 CDBG grant. Is that how much it was? Uh, part of the, one of the per requirements of that is, is that you re get to where, where you're at 50% of disbursements. Uh, you give an update status on the project. I'm not exactly sure why, but it is a, a step along the way. We had a public hearing before we did the before we did this project as well. Uh, it's just a, another step along the way just to keep everybody up to date of where we are on the locust separation project. Okay. Anybody have any questions for Jim on that, gang? <coughs> Seeing none. Next up is a resolution approving the purchase of two rooftop units for public works. Nick. Uh, the resolution in front of you would be uh, authorizing the purchase of two rooftop units uh, at the Public Works facility um, from Frank Millard Company for $21,816. Uh, currently in the CIP for fiscal year 21, which we would have set uh, back in March, uh, we put in $16,000 in the budget for uh, one of the rooftop units. Since then, during the summer when we started, it uh, started falling apart. Um, and we actually inquired when we did the, for the one unit, we required what it would take for two. Um, and it was only a little bit more to try and get that done. The large part is to get a crane and get those two units up there. Mm -hmm. um, I would recommend replacing these. And it's because it's over, over the budget and it's two units instead of one, that's the why, reason why you're seeing it in front of you. So okay. I would recommend approval on that. Anybody have any cost, uh, concerns on that? No. So just to clarify, we're doing two units for 21800 Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Nick. Uh, next up uh, would be on the pr proposed consent agenda. First is resolution approving <laughs> nuisance and demolition abatements for various properties. Anybody see anything? Mow your grass, people, please. Uh, number two is a resolution approving final acceptance and final payment for the re lease and retention monies for the 2017 Harris Avenue Storm Sewer Improvements Project. Uh, this uh, resolution finally closes this. Uh, it's probably the longest standing capital project we have out there. Uh, so Harrison Street at the end of the bluff, uh, we had a sanitary line and a storm sewer line. This is kind of the prerequisite project to the issue that we now have. Uh, we separated the storm sewer so that it wouldn't infiltrate into the sanitary line and cause us problems. Um, so this project is closing out. Uh, we hired Phi excavating for it. Uh, 
we originally awarded contract at 243,000 and change uh, through some quantity adjustment and change orders we ended up less than that at $238,000 uh, the account was out of uh, sewer separation funds okay. um, everything seems to be okay other than the issues that we now have that are kind of secondary that'll be to next that. up correct okay any questions there gang no uh, next up, re resolution for approving an amendment to the agreement with the HR Green Inc. for design of the location basin super sewer separation project. Uh, so the resolution in front of you would approve an, uh, an amendment with HR Green, uh, who we hired at the beginning of the locust separation project. Uh, we had a design contract with them for eight hundred and seventy thousand uh, dollars to design uh, what it amounted to be, be about seven million dollars in sewer separation work. Uh, as the contractor is, uh, has gone through some of Walnut, the, the roadway was planned to be an asphalt patch. Um, as they been began excavating, the roads kind of crumbled in on top of it, rather than going back in with asphalt uh, replacement. Um, for, for the dollars that we got bid on that project, it makes sense to do uh, concrete or PCC. Um, but in order to do that, we do need it designed so that way the slopes and everything makes sense. Uh, the $13,500 amendment in there is for them to design the two blocks. Um, it feels fairly steep for that type of work, but we got an amendment, which you may have noticed it was amendment two. We actually had an amendment for another block where we made that same type of change order. Mm -hmm. We were able to do that in-house quicker. We just don't have the ability to do this one. So it was actually higher than this amendment. So I, I feel comfortable doing a little bit more work for this dollar figure. but. Uh, okay. Go ahead. What's PCC? Concrete. Okay. Thank you. I Portland. Was ask you Portland. Something. Portland. You said concrete or PCC. No, I said. And I'm sorry, like, I meant what? like a slash. <laughs> All right. Good. I'm glad you asked that because I was going to ask the same thing. All right. Any any questions on that? No. Uh, number four: resolution for accepting the final draft of Cascade Bridge study from Impact 7G. Uh, following the uh, presentation by Impact 7G in at the end of July. Uh, we've had to uh, go in and revise any sort of typos and corrections, and now in the packet uh, for you to approve uh, is the final draft version of that. And I think the importance of this is to uh, one accept and you know mo take the information that they gathered and provided for you to use that kind of as your decision making uh, moving forward. So, will we get a hard copy by any chance? A hard copy? Mm -hmm. We can print one off for you. I there's, mean, it was there's just one of them. well, there's. Yeah, one of the okay. packet, but not one I just didn't want to put it. I have it. I have it on the packet. There's yeah. a digital copy that I think it's like 300 some pages. So, I mean, we can make a hard copy. There's no reason why we can for filing purposes. But Yeah. Any, other, any questions, gang? No? Okay. Number five, resolution for approving Tiger Grant agreement for construction phase. Uh, so, this resolution would authorize the mayor to sign um, the Tiger Grant agreement. Uh, we had a previous Tiger Grant agreement that authorized the engineering portion, uh, the kind of the timeline and the dollars that obligated those funds to pay for our engineering. Uh, we have a second phase to obligate the, the remaining funds to do. Um, there is a red line copy of that grant agreement in there. It isn't finally approved. That's actually at headquarters of Federal Highway. Um, the reason why this is in here um, is because of the timetable and what we have left prior to the obligation time frame. Um, it has to be obligated by February, or February, man, September 18th in the FEMIS. I got the F got mm -hmm. in my way. Um, their system. So before this and then another council meeting, I would just want to give the authorization uh, to the mayor to sign off on that Tiger Grant agreement. I don't see anything really changing in the uh, grant agreement. A lot of its timelines on the dates that we are, are going to try and hit uh, and then it obligates the funds okay so it's it's ne absolutely necessary uh, to have the funds to be able to do the project so I would recommend approving it so just want to give a little bit more explanation on okay. why you're approving it prior to actually having her signed an agreement from Federal Highway questions on that one uh, it looks like they're making some progress on our other calls too yeah and as a we sent off stuff to BNSF they we overnighted some things to them and they're aware of it uh, the the NEPA clearance got approved for the impact monitoring and we should by the end of the week have the core uh, 
permit in hand or ready and then uh, we just need to hear from Fish and Wildlife. But I, Leo's been on in their ear for the last week or two. Fantastic. So I think we should be getting that. The biggest thing will be will be BNSF and yeah. how long they take uh, to get the rail agreement back to us. And that's the reason why I gave authorization in the previous council meeting for you to sign that is because right. it, the timetables might be pretty compressed getting yeah. towards that September Fish 18th. and Wildlife is the muscles issue, right? Correct. And where are we on that? So what happened is, is because of the river level and the temperature that the river level has to be, we ran out of complete time until we were able to get it done in May. Mm -hmm. Well, they found two um, mussels, a Higgins eye nice. and a yellow, I don't know what it is, um, but they're on the endangered species list, which means you have to perform a biological assessment, basically saying and stating what you're gonna do with these mussels. Well, the simple answer is you move them. Um, but they have to create this biological assessment, and I think this has probably got to be one of the fastest biological assessments in history. Um, and it got sent off to Fish and Wildlife. They have to read it, dissect it, come up with a biological opinion. They, at the same time, with the Corps of Engineers, have a permit together, and then once those are approved, we get NEPA clearance, which is National Environmental Protection, whatever, clearance, and that. Technically, you need NEPA clearance before any plans and specifications are approved through Iowa DOT. Iowa DOT has realized some of the things that we've had to jump through and has been doing the check plans and is approving it. I don't think they can finally clear it until we have the NEPA clearance, but it's just the whole stack of cards and the muscle study was really what was throwing us off. So that's kind of the reason why we've engaged in some of the conversations with the folks that we have. So. Okay. Okay. Um, Two muscles? Yeah. Two styles. Two styles. Correct. Okay. There was a total of 300 and some muscles found in the area um, of the riverfront where we were going to plan to do their tiger grant work. Okay. Are they good to eat? <laughs> Jim, did you have something to add? <laughs> Thanks, Don. I needed that. Thanks. Um, and one of the things with that muscle study, I think that part of the process that's going to come out of it is a, in about a monitoring period that will be part of our grant agreement on the back side too right. and that'll get incorporated into our funding stream if you want to is that going to cost uh, us some money yeah it's going to cost money if they if we have to move them too so there's no sense in going in there and trying to move them now because construction on that phase is still two years out but I think it's a five or six year monitoring period. So our Tiger Grant funds will have actually probably been exhausted by that time unless you build it into a contract with whoever moves it as that part of a monitoring contract, yeah. which is what I would assume we would do. Yeah, okay. that would be what I would think would be the best. And because I don't know what that type of work can cost, but it could cost more than you might think. Yeah. Now, Nick, I just think it's kind of interesting. So the muscles are important to the ecosystem because of why? I don't know. This. I'm the wrong because guy to answer that question. Because they're endangered? Okay. It, they must do they're something. on a list within the Fish and Wildlife Organization. Okay. And because federal funded work is going in there, we have to make sure we don't Damage cause ill them. harm to them. Yeah. If, if we were to go in and do work and they were to find dead Mussel shells from construction, we could be fined up to like certain five thousand dollars a smash shell or something like that. Wow. If I was endangered, I'd want them to wait for me too. So the one trouble, so <laughs> the I seventy four bridge up in There's the Quad Cities month. actually found some Higgins eye mussels as well. They and their brilliant uh, work moved the mussels upstream of the work, and then as work is going on, they migrated right back down to where they had originally been in the first place. <laughs> So I would hope we would have more logic than that okay. uh, having to move any muscles here. But after, after some of the dredging or flooding, maybe next year we can not have to worry about okay. it. But I don't know. We'll see. Jim, do you have something else there? Uh, yeah, I did want to mention as you go through those documents, you notice there's 3.1 million or no, 2.8 million of city funds, I think, in there. 2.7 of that is for sewer separation. Uh, we've incorporated. Uh, Knowing that we're gonna, we have so, some sewer lines to put in. Uh, while we're having the work done, we're gonna go ahead and replace those lines now, uh, rather than have to come back and do that after the project happens. Uh, there's another hundred thousand dollar match that has to do with the Great Places funding for what we're doing on the riverfront. Uh, 
uh, it show, the project also shows the 300,000 that we were receiving from the state. So there's an overall 3.1 million shown in there that's the non-federal funds. If, if that comes up and someone's questioning why there's city money in this, it's for work that's, uh, that we're doing as, with other projects that we're tying into this and have to incorporate the work okay. together. Um, did want to note, note uh, you talked about the Harrison Street. You know, we had funds borrowed from Cascade uh, a long time ago that we've been using to pay for Cascade sewer separation. Uh, Harrison Street was part of that, uh, that we had funds that were still there that we were using to cover that. Uh, as we move forward with the emergency work that needs done over the bluff at that same location, we're just tying it into that same sewer separation work and covering out of the funding that's still left over in that borrowing that we did several years ago. Okay. And did I, the work that was supposed to get done several years ago get done? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, we had, one of the things that we end up doing is you do bond, you borrow funds for, with an estimated cost. And I assume that at one point we had a project that we had an estimated cost. And when we actually got the bids back, it was less than what the work was. Well, we're doing additional work for the same in that in that same vein in that same area and it matches the purpose of what we were had originally borrowed it for so that's perfect it it fits with why we're why we'd use that funding source for it that okay. was the line that went like out over the, the water like, no. no uh that this goes this is water that overflows it goes to and bluff. it just goes down the the bluff and dis discharges into the river it's okay. storm water gotcha. uh, we have a there's, we have a sewer line that's in that same area that, that the sewer line goes, ends up going the Mississippi sewer interceptor. That's the interceptor, that, right. And that does go under the, the uh, river for at least a little bit of, of the distance, maybe not very far, but it's part of the way it, uh, to the plant it is under the river. Okay. Maybe not now when it's lower. So. Any other questions on that game? No. no? Okay. Well, uh, last but not least, resolution for approving interlocal agreement between the City of Burlington and Des Moines County for the 2020 Burn Justice Assistance Grant JAG Award or Program Award. Chief. Yes. Uh, this resolution is, uh, we did this same thing last year and we purchased some equipment. It's an annual um, award that's given to us, or not given, but we apply for, uh, for equipment that we have to uh, share that equipment or the funds uh, with a disparate agency, which is the uh, Des Moines County Sheriff's Department. So we approach uh, you as the city council and we approach the Board of Supervisors to sign this uh, interlocal agreement. And basically this year it's uh, for uh, the funds they want to disperse is $22,272 for equipment that will benefit law enforcement, not just for us, but for the Sheriff's Department, department also. Uh, and we uh, check with the Sheriff's Department and make sure that it's uh, uh, something that we'll all be able to use or we can give them that a part of that equipment. I know we've done it for body cameras in years past. Last year we did it for pole cameras uh, for surveillance. Uh, and uh, so this year we're looking at doing what's called a Cellbrite mobile data extraction device. Uh, what that is is basically an opportunity for us to extract information uh, from a cell phone in an investigation after we apply for search warrants. Right now we depend upon uh, the Iowa DCI has uh, someone that's uh, in our area that does that when they're available. So sometimes there's a lag period there uh, for us getting that information in a timely manner. We have to wait for them to be at work or to be available. If that one person takes vacation, we kind of have to wait until they come back. Hmm. So this, this agreement and this equipment would be uh, ours between us and the Sheriff's Department available for investigations for them or us and uh, the other agency would be West Burlington Police Department which we wouldn't wouldn't hesitate to uh, help our law enforcement partners in that aspect the other part is uh, the the training for the equipment use uh, our evidence uh, specialist uh, has agreed to uh, go to the training and be available uh, for that uh, extraction and so it would uh, be part of evidence that's extracted and, and uh, so it'd be kind of uh, nice to have that equipment in the evidence room and then we'll just do the extraction there. And uh, the Sheriff's Department also will have somebody that's available for that training on how to use that device to extract that information and how to make it uh, available to the investigators. Any questions for the Chief? 
I will say, uh, real quick, real you quick. go ahead and ask your question. Uh, Chief, that was just called a cell phone extraction device? Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. Yeah, the name, of the, the name of the equipment is a Cellbrite mobile data extraction device. Okay. okay. It Cellbrite's sounds like a very valuable piece of equipment to have. And it's been available to us, like I said, for years through the DCI. We just have to uh, get a hold of their personnel to do it, and it's something that, that we can use these funds for. That way we have it on site for us. Oh, yeah, a lot more uh, timely if you had it on site. I could see that, yeah. Yeah, or if he's gone and somebody needs mm -hmm. uh, some information extracted, and your, our partners in Henry County or Lee County, they can come to us, and as long as we're certified in the extraction of it, we're good to go. Time is of the essence a lot of times. Yep. Sometimes it is, yes. Uh, just wanted to thank you for my experience down on the training unit. Uh, you know, I reflected on that after after that on Friday, and it's amazing how quickly, even on those planned scenarios, and I thought I knew what was coming, mm -hmm. how quickly that turns. It's a, uh, it's a, hats off to the the men and women of the PD because it's a scary proposition dealing with some of those scenarios. So yeah, it's uh, the the firearms training simulator. It. it and, and I explained to you some of the benefits mm -hmm. uh, with that equipment, and, and, and I'll offer it up to the rest of the council if you want an opportunity to come down and uh, go through a display. I know the mayor wasn't, uh, was a little hesitant to get a hold of our uh, training devices and go through some of the scenarios, but uh, we promised no cameras, no videotaping, uh, anything like that. So You still need to know. So, <laughs> so. Um, Oh, and I really, I, I really would look this. forward to to you, Mr. Rinker, coming down, and we'll put you through some scenarios and see if see, I still got it. See how it goes. See how it goes. Yeah, I didn't do too bad on the one and the other one. <clears throat> I had to apologize to the lady, but I knew she was drawing, so I just wanted <laughs> it over with. So. But there's more to it than just the scenario yeah. base. There's yeah. uh, accuracy and and uh, you know just basic functions of the firearms that it helps us with, and it's right there at the police department. I know that over the weekend usually they have. Uh, an instructor uh, that's available and I know our uh, night shift got an opportunity to do some training on Sunday night so I know they're using it quite frequently yeah, I, I could you could definitely see the time savings as far as overtime driving and the and the savings in am, ammunition plus it's just great training so I I was I was completely impressed with it that was money well spent so thank you for that no thank you you're welcome any other questions good chief thanks step forward anytime you want it was pretty good Staff, any, uh, anything for you, Eric? Chief, you don't have anything else to add, I, I assume, since you sat down? Don, I don't know if the muscles are good. I'll find out. Chief, Trexel, no? Nick? Probably sauteing in butter. Every time you get up, Nick, I know it's going to cost us money. No, this is good. Okay. Uh, so you saw a press release probably go out this uh, on Friday last week for work that will happen this week. Uh, traffic signage went out, I think, today um, for the Seal Coat project. Um, in the press release, we put a map, which is almost is way easier to understand where that work is going to happen. Uh, that work will start Wednesday, pending weather. Um, and then next week, the uh, Dalbar retrofit is slated to start. Uh, and we're going to send out letters to the property owners in that area to let them know. Uh, that work will kind of you know, mess up their travels for a little bit. It won't close off access, but it will be one lane road with a, like a pilot car and uh, uh, stoplights at some okay. points or flaggers. So that'll kick off next week. Great. Jim, Stephanie, did you have anything? No. So I would say Stephanie may end up having a resolution for transfers if we have any issues here uh, this next this next session. Uh, we're in the process of closing out uh, fis last fiscal year, fiscal year 20. And one of the things I know is we're doing transfers. I don't think that she was going to need it, but if we end up with the tr transfers between funds that go over authorized amounts, we have to have approval from you before we can make those transfers, and we're down to the to the wire. And there's, I think, one account maybe that you're close on that I don't think you're going to go over. But if she does, we may add a resolution for that. Okay. Uh, radio. Yeah. Yes. Who can do council talk this week, Linda? Anybody else? You got a new baby, don't you? Yeah, I'm. I'm you need I'm, sleep. Well, <laughs> I can do it if no one else can, but I. I know you can't. First week of school. I'm out. You're I've out. got meetings all okay. week. Okay, so Linda and I. Thanks, Jim. Uh, other, 
we you had a little bit of discussion on a Tama site that hopefully that project I don't know what his timing's going to end up being as he has authorization to move forward he's still waiting for that authorization so when it, at least we've started to see some action with that and see where he ends up being uh, as he does finally get the release of funds and can and then put together a schedule for that project to, to begin uh, the blob building has been coming along. You guys have been keeping up with the inspections. I know they have a couple of things that are major issues that still need to be done as part of that before they can issue a certificate of occupancy. But uh, somewhere around October 1, they should be in a position, dependent on where they are with that, to, to have that occur. And one of the things we have to have is a parking lot. You're kicking off a pre-construction meeting tomorrow on that? So that's one of the things, as they go through that pre-construction meeting, they'll, they'll put together their work, proposed work schedule for getting that work done, and hopefully it lines up fairly well with what we need for the parking lot there. But um, Former PB, PD building, uh, Merge had been after, uh, they had a couple of issues come up with their project. One, they got some quotes back on demolition that were significantly higher. I don't know what significantly means. Uh, what their definition of it is, they didn't share them, but were significantly higher than they had anticipated. Uh, they also did not receive the, is that workforce housing tax credits that they were mm -hmm. after? Uh, close to a million dollars. Um, so for perspective, there, the state of Iowa put out a fund, fund request. They had 10 million available. Uh, they received 35 million of applications. Mm -hmm. uh, they, this project did not get awarded funds. Um, Merge did receive funds on another one of their projects. They, no, they noted that on the other one, I mean, the only difference that they saw between them, that was one that was uh, built, was, was ready to be built on. Uh, they are probably going to come back and, well, I know they're going to come back and negotiate with us to, to see if we're interested in cons considering uh, going through the same type of, a similar process for next year. We've already been in some level of communications and they would put forward a, a, at some point here in the next couple of months, I assume, a, a term sheet of what they'd like to see if they were, if they were to consider for, the, for doing this again. Now, if the council mm -hmm. wants to entertain that, it would be a separate development agreement because this, this one is um, had a time frame for closure this year. Uh, what they're doing is there were some of the contingencies. One mm -hmm. of those was receiving workforce housing tax credits. They didn't receive it. Uh, so they're not exercising their option to proceed. Um, we'd have to go through the, a new process for getting a development agreement in place that would probably be fairly similar to what we saw last year. Um, so that's just something to look, look <laughs> for to see occur as, as you move forward. You're going to have to d evaluate if you want to move forward like that or not. Uh, we had the option to just do a demo ourselves. I think that we would find if we do the demo of our property, uh, all we're doing, if they, if we're still going to entertain giving a lot to them, is increasing the overall project mm -hmm. cost to do two separate demos. Uh, we could do the demo and have a different avenue for moving forward. It doesn't make sense to me, but if that's what you wanted to do, we certainly sure. could. Yeah, I wondered if they would be eligible to possibly apply for that again next year. They so. can. And now, is did it they the same funding source that they're after that they listed in that? Do you do you remember? They're also looking at the Brownfield Greenfield tax credits. And that may be the the tax credits route, maybe because they're going to want us to sponsor if, if if that's the route they move forward. Uh, give them a letter of support on it. Uh, maybe a, a route that gives them an a, alternative that gives them another another way to make this project occur. Okay. So. Did they close on both buildings? Uh, they just closed on the other one. They did not close on ours. On ours because of it. Because okay. of this. Okay. So they own the other building, right? They own the other building. So, yeah, they're still committed to trying to make this work. That doesn't mean they can't sell the other building, too. But. Sure. Okay. Um, and just a couple of other items to note. You know, we're as we move forward with what's happened this year, uh, this has been the year of change in... Uh, personnel policy wise we're on our sixth version fifth or sixth version of a pers personnel policy dealing with COVID related issues and it's just going to keep on happening uh, as we move forward every time there's a 
an update to um, what the recommendations are that are out there, we have to update our policy. And you know, we've talked about it uh, with department heads and with the attorney, and we just want to make sure that we're we're keeping up with the mo the, the most current recommended practices and keeping our policies up to date with them and uh, putting ourselves in the best position to protect everyone's safety and avoid lawsuit too. We yeah. always like that. Um, something that came out over the weekend uh, that is going to be difficult to see what happens with. I don't know. It's part, partially probably a bargaining chip, but it's there, an executive order on payroll taxes. I don't know how we're going to implement it. I don't know what our options are moving forward. Uh, we'll see how that proceeds, but um, you know those kinds of things sort of make our lives difficult. But it's the same for every employer. All right. Uh, so that's another thing that you know as we move forward that we're having to deal with. Like, where do our policies need to adjust? Sure. So is that's there, all I had. So is there any update on the pool? Uh, it's it, fixed. Test and liner, and you've tested it, and I don't know that you've came up with any issues. So, so what we're doing yet this fall, we're not opening, but we, we're, we are looking to fill it, I think, so you can do some training, uh, recertifications of guards who would otherwise uh, lose. lose those certifications. Okay. We're going to fill it for that? Can uh, we just use somebody else's? We, had, we wanted to fill it for no other, for the purpose, too, I think, just to see if it was okay and there weren't if any it's problems. Fixed. Okay. That well, was my that. primary concern, is I didn't want to fork out a couple thousand dollars yeah. to fill it, yeah. just to get certifications. Can we do the dog swim if we fill it? We can't say we're the liner. Oh, rats. <laughs> my so that's going to stay somewhere else. <laughs> my dogs will be sad. River's open. Uh, is that all you have then? Yeah. Okay, thanks, Joe. Mm -hmm. uh, council, Bill? The only thing I have is one school's already open, other schools are going to be opening, kids are going to be walking. Kind of watch out for them. Thank you for that. Robert? Uh, mussels taste like chicken. Uh, <laughs> I, I really don't know. I, I had my baby on uh, Wednesday. Congratulations. So it's uh, is part of our life now, and uh, the kids uh, eat like crazy. So I'm a little sleep deprived, and I'm not sure it always makes sense. So <laughs> next. Matt? Uh, I just want to encourage everyone to keep the uh, family and friends of a former council member who passed away this last week in their thoughts and prayers. Amen. Linda? I learned a new word today. De Rachel. De Rachel. It means a severe windstorm widespread with damaging winds. And I know my father who lives in Ames, it just ripped trees out by the roots and took both his ham radio antennas, so he won't be doing any ham radio for a while. So anyway, bottom line is be safe. We've had some severe erratic weather going through, so everybody stay away from those windows and, and, and take the necessary precautions and be safe. Uh, I, I don't really have anything except just a, a point of good news. I was in West, Kenosha, Wisconsin this weekend Ooh. and ran into some friends of mine that and I don't hang out with them, but they come to Burlington every year to vacation. What a great thing that is. They come to Burlington, they came down to play a golf course, they stayed at Fun City, they called me and I was busy that night that they were here. Normally they'll stay three or four days and do steamboat days, uh, but I was up in Kenosha and was talking to them and, and uh, we were at a, a restaurant and I, they were just telling anybody that would listen what a great town Burlington is. So sometimes it's worthwhile to hear somebody that's not from here, because we see all the warts, uh, to hear what a great and attractive town Burlington is. It really made me proud to be from Burlington, and uh, who knows, maybe we'll get some more vacationers from Kenosha, Wisconsin. Yeah. Can they so. shoot a commercial for us? I don't know. I have to ask. There's a, there's a great place there called the Coffee Pot. To eat. Yes. It's uh, awesome. And, yeah, we were there. Yeah. I needed this. Well, I'll tell you that later. Anyway, uh, <laughs> that's all I have. Let's.